So why shall we talk about the UK and um, the, the lockdown, the ending of lockdown, the steps forward, the progress made, the half steps, the errors. Um, you've been a very keen observer of this. Give us your, th your thinking on the last week or so. Yeah, it continues to be sort of dizzying um, in the sense that there are sort of little developments every day. And, you know, there's a two steps forward and one or two steps back and lots of pivots. Um, and it's hard, it's you know, again, hard, even as someone who's a keen observer to, to really keep up on this. So maybe let's start with the sort of the, the numbers and the trajectory, right? There's some good news and some bad news in the numbers. Overall, of course, we are seeing a continued decline in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, at least those that are reported. Um, and, and even things like no new reported deaths in Northern Ireland, I think over about a three-day period. Um, in England, the reported deaths are um, uh, at the lowest rate this last week as they have been since the lockdown began. Um, so it's continued to trend downward and that's good, but all these trends have been very slow. Um, unfortunately, it's been kind of protracted and there's been a very long tail. Um, um, the sort of flip side of that is that um, the Office of National Statistics updated some of their reporting yesterday and, um, and now have a figure of about 51,000 deaths across the UK. But actually when they updated the kind of excess deaths um, figures and excess deaths is comparing how many people have died over this period compared to the average of how many people die at the same time period in previous years. Um, it's about 64,000 across the UK now. And that would, that would comprise people who died of COVID with that on their death certificate, people who died of COVID but maybe weren't reported because they died at home, it wasn't on their death certificate, et cetera. And then people who died of other things, but perhaps because they weren't able to get medical care or weren't seeking medical care in a way that's an indirect casualty of the pandemic. So it's really staggering um, that that human toll. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, again, we can go back and, and, and relitigate that, but I think it's, a, it, it's worth taking a moment just to, you know, I think, again, recognize that the, the size and scale of the loss that, that uh, we've all suffered. Um, you know, all that said, things are very slowly tending, trending in the right direction. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're in the midst of trying to find ways to reopen um, uh, certain aspects of the economy. I think there's a real sense of desperation around um, uh, further kind of job loss and economic damage. And that seems to be driving a lot of this, um, you know, from what we can tell, um, from where bits of evidence from the government and from SAGE are being published. Um, there's, it's not clear that the sort of the scientific evidence is guiding a lot of this. It seems like there's a lot of political decisions to try to get things open back up as quickly as possible. And I think that's le leading to some of this kind of jerking back and forth on making some promises about stuff that's going to happen and then actually getting some backlash or realizing actually it's not going to be safe to do so. Um, and, and that's kind of um, created all this kind of whiplash that we're facing most notably with schools, something that we've talked about here several times in the past, um, where you know schools have reopened to a couple of early year groups um, over the last sort of week or so, very different around the country. About a little over half of schools around the country have actually followed through on that advice. In the Northwest, it's a very small number. Um, and the hope was to push forward and get all primary school students back for a month before the, the academic year ends, which always sounded a little bit crazy to me um, to try to be able to do that in any way safely. And, uh, and over the last day, the government has retracted that and said it actually it's not going to happen. Um, and that's probably for the best. And, and realistically, I think what we can hope for is that we use this period of the remaining academic year um, with sort of very limited reopening of schools in a very cautious way as hopefully a learning opportunity for schools to figure out how to do this safely. Schools, school communities, parents, et cetera. Um, and there was an announcement actually of a study that's, um, that's gonna be launched involving about 100 schools that's gonna look at 
transmission. They're going to screen teachers and students and try to get a sense of how much transmission is happening in schools as things reopen. That could be really important for us to figure out how to do this at scale the next academic year. So that's, you know, that's really good. We had the, um, the imposition of the 14 day quarantine for returning or for travelers coming into the UK, um, which has been quite controversial, particularly amongst the, the travel and hospitality industry um, for obvious reasons. So that's being rolled out. Um, uh, there's been sort of incomplete um, uh, respecting of, uh, of, of, those, of those rules, I think, and there's already hints that they're going to start to um, withdraw that as soon as the end of the month, or at least implement these so-called air bridges where certain countries would have an agreement to say, well, if you're coming from a low prevalence country, maybe you don't have to quarantine, but from other places you, you do. Um, I don't think that's all that's a bad thing. It's just coming about five months later than probably it should have. Um, it, it, it sort of is what it is. And then shops and restaurants and pubs, um, again, supposedly cautious reopening um, as of the 15th, outdoor markets started, shops the 15th, um, restaurants and pubs I'm hearing sort of different things about. Um, overall, I would say that we are taking a gamble by doing quite a number of things quite quickly um, in the context of number one, still really high rates of transmission in the country, five to 8,000 new cases per day, most of which we're actually not even detecting, um, even with expanded testing, we're not catching most of those. Um, and without um, this kind of vaunted test trace isolate um, or test track isolate program um, being in place, you know, with every passing day, um, and we see more reports about the app not being functional and perhaps not being functional for some time. The army of 25,000 contact tracers mostly sitting around having only traced 1,500 people as of the other day. Um, so it's not really happening. It's not really working. Um, it appears to be a bit of a, a, a bit of a white elephant. So, yeah, I heard recently that it may not be fully functional until September. This is really dangerous because again, this is what we need to make sure that we're gonna stop new little outbreaks of infection popping up around the country and if we don't have the surveillance and the intelligence to detect it and to stop it, we're really obviously risking, um, risking going back. So it remains a, a perilous period in the UK. Around Europe, you know, it's been interesting around the world, I guess, in places that have opened up. Um, a lot of Europe so far in countries that were sort of in similar straits to an extent, Spain, France, et cetera, that have opened up have not seen big upticks in cases so far, but in other places, definitely there have been. Um, uh, in, in sort of the worst case would be probably Iran, which is facing a, a full on second wave. Their, their curve now looks like a, a two humped camel, just like the, the famous kind of Spanish flu graphs that we've probably all seen. Um, in some other places, we've definitely seen it come roaring back. And so we know it's out there um, uh, and, and we are taking some gambles. It's a calculated risk, I think, in favor of, uh, you know, sort of the economy right now, frankly. So, so let's, wh why do you think um, the Spains, the France, the, the, the Italy, Germany, where you've seen their you know, they locked down ahead of the UK, they opened up ahead of the UK and you, you haven't seen the kind of second waves, well, at least, you know, this is very early and very imperfect data to be sure. Um, but in the way that you've seen, you almost see a flip, whether if I'm getting this correct, you know, you see the global South just really alarming. Brazil is terrifying. Um, you know, there've been upticks in my home country in South Africa. There's, you know, the global South is, is there's almost like a bromide where where it's where it's flipped. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess there are two questions. One is um, if that's going to be the case, uh, we're the transmission from the global south back into the north is going to be very hard to prevent and 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 slow down. I should imagine, given travel and patterns, unless we start, you know fortressing up our countries, which has a whole set of other political and economic consequences. Um, and then the second and related question is, is why are we not seeing the second wave in, in, uh, in Europe, do you think? I mean, it may just be speculation or theories at this point. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, it's I've been saying for a long time, we're in the early days of this pandemic, right? And we're actually seeing if you sort of look globally, signs of acceleration right now. Yesterday was the highest um, single daily toll of new cases um, that we've recorded across the planet since this pandemic started. And as you mentioned, that's being driven largely by pretty alarming increases in the global south, in particular in uh, in, in, in Latin America, Brazil sort of chief amongst them, but really if you look at almost every country um, in, in, in South America and then up towards Mexico, for the most part, you're seeing um, what looked like the early phase of real exponential increase. Um, South Asia, um, India, Pakistan in particular, um, you mentioned South Africa, so lots of increases. In many of those places, there either kind of wasn't necessarily a lockdown and it just took a while to kind of get there and maybe it's speeding up now as some of those southern hemisphere countries reach their kind of winter months. Um, in some places, the lockdowns were lifted while cases were still going up. And this has happened in the US as well, right? Where there was some version of a kind of a lockdown or extreme um, social and physical distancing. Um, but rather than kind of, you know, um, flattening the curve and then waiting for things to come down before releasing these things, when you're still kind of here and plateauing a bit, then withdrawing on those things. And that's what we're seeing um, in South Africa, for example, where, you know, the, the, the lockdown that was done early on did have an effect and saved a lot of lives, but I think they weren't able to sustain it um, long enough. It just became too painful. But you're at a place where you already had a significant amount of transmission happening, and then you start to then put people back into proximity, et cetera, et cetera, um, and it's going to take off more quickly, right? Um, there are a lot more sort of embers um, that can then start to kind of roar back to life um, uh, than in other places where you waited longer. Um, so that brings me back to your other question about why we haven't seen a big uptick in um, in, in some other um, European countries. There's probably no single answer for that. I think probably in some cases that they waited to open back up until transmission was fairly low. Um, and for mo in most cases, it was significantly lower than it was in the UK when we started to ease lockdowns. Um, um, Spain would probably be the closest, and I think they were at about 2,000 reported daily cases when they started, but then they kind of pulled back and waited another couple of weeks and then started again. Um, but in other countries, oftentimes new cases were down to oftentimes less than 1,000 new cases per day. So when you have a lot less transmission, it gives you a lot more kind of breathing room um, before you start to see things tilting back with a, with a higher R and things like that. Um, you know, everybody's opened up a little bit differently for the most part, it's been, um, it, it's been fairly cautious. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, that, you know, I've been um, uh, pushing hard on with lots of others lately is around um, face coverings. Um, and I've heard a lot on social media from folks in Spain and elsewhere kind of saying like, this has just become the norm here now, everybody wears them everywhere. Um, there's been mounting and pretty solid evidence, not amazing evidence, but pretty solid evidence that wearing face coverings, um, you know, protects a, a person from transmitting to other people, right? My mask protects you. And that because asymptomatic transmission is so, um, such a significant part of this pandemic, um, anywhere from 15 to 40% of transmission can be in people who are not having symptoms at that moment, we should talk about WHO on that in a bit, um, that it's really important, right? That one of the ways we can get back to things safely unless we can test everybody every day is simply to cover our faces when we're out and about in public spaces. And in two institutions that had really been lagging in, in guidance on this were the, the UK government and the World Health Organization both of them over the last week have come around and said it to some extent, face coverings are important. In the UK, the recommendation now is um, mandatory on public transport, um, but for some reason not starting until the 15th of June. Doesn't really make sense to me. If it's good on the 15th of June, it's probably good today. Um, and WHO has said in general, in public places where social distancing is difficult, wear a face covering, ideally with 
three layers, which we can talk about if you want to. So I think that in general, places that have made face coverings an important part of um, sort of just the way things, the way life is as you start to open up um, have probably fared well. And that certainly is consistent with the correlation across Asia as well. There's no country that has really beaten back COVID-19 where face coverings are not essentially the norm. And do you think that that will then, I mean, does, does that face coverings, some kind of social distancing, um, and then, you know, the slow accretion of better medical interventions, better treatments and a, and a vaccine. But as we bridge into this, the, the, the kind of, there's no silver bullets, but a big, big limiter of transmission and the easiest, most low cost uh, way to do it is just to enculturate face coverings. And, and that is what it really should have, not just in public transport, but, but it should be when you go out in the UK for the next six months, you should be wearing face coverings. Yeah, not a silver bullet at all, but I think it's a really important tool and it's not that hard. Um, yeah. It's not rocket science. We should we should just be doing it right now. That's asymptomatic or asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission, reading transmission amongst somebody who doesn't have any symptoms at the moment is an important you know, driver of transmission. It's still the minority, it's just invisible. And so that's why it's so important. It doesn't replace the need for much more widespread testing and then the ability to, every time somebody tests positive, to be able to quickly get that person in isolation safely and sometimes support them to be in isolation, um, something else that we, we should talk about, um, to trace their contacts and to get those people tested and quarantined as quickly as possible because you know it's, a, it's about a five or six day period from the time you get infected until the time you show symptoms typically, but you can be transmitting for a couple of days before. So that really only leaves like a three or four day window from the time somebody is having symptoms to when they're, you know, the, the next person is becoming infectious. So if you're having a two or three day turnaround time for tests, if the contact tracing is not operating really efficiently, um, you actually lose a lot of value if the process is slow and inefficient. So all of that needs to be happening. If you combine that system with face coverings and then with, um, you know, smart kind of physical distancing measures, you know, only reopening certain things in certain ways and moving cautiously on that, um, that's probably the recipe for a reasonably kind of um, return to semi-normality. So Peter, let me ask you a question just about what the, pro, you know, testing and tracing is there an argument for prophylactic testing? By that I mean, because obviously, until you become symptomatic, you don't know whether you should test and you don't know how often you should test. And, you know, if you're a person who is tearing tickets at a sport event, you know, or is highly engaged with large numbers of people by the nature of your, your job. And we're not going to be able to avoid those kinds of jobs forever. Those jobs are coming back. Um, is it economically viable? Is it compliant with kind of labor and human rights standards? And is it best practice to say, you need to be uh, you know, tested every three to four days so that you're in the asymptomatic window well, um, and therefore you, you're catching things even before people get sick so they can't transmit? Or is that just impractical, too expensive, not acceptable to force people to do that? Give us your thinking on that conundrum. Yeah, you know, there's there's been some experimentation with this, for example, in some parts of Germany with school reopenings. This has been trialed where students get tested every every four days or every week or so and you actually so you as, as part of your kind of routine screening you get a test and you get a little sticker that says i'm clear and if you test negative then you're good for the next interval to continue to go to school and then everyone feels a lot more confident that you don't need to have uh, the kind of little bubbles and extreme distancing and things like that for those people and then ideally you catch you catch students early this has been for older older students and it's not national to my knowledge um, and we've we've seen proposals 
rules for this for athletes that are coming back as sports leagues try to figure this out, that athletes and staff members will get regularly tested um, and protocols being put in place for what to do if a certain number of people test positive. Um, at scale, I think it would be difficult to do. Um, you, you could sort of say in a, in a kind of abstract vacuum, sure, let's test everybody once a week or so, and that probably um, could be really effective. We know that in general, there's still a global shortage of testing. Um, and one of the reasons that we're not doing enough testing here, despite everything we hear about, we have excess capacity, all this kind of stuff, there's still shortages of swabs and all kinds of other things globally. So it's not going to be so easy easy to ramp that up. There could even arguably be some ethical issues if you start to say, well, in a setting of scarcity, should professional footballers be taking up lots of tests if others who really need them aren't getting them? Um, and so that's something I think we're going to have to kind of continue to, um, to continue to grapple with. So I think in targeted settings and maybe over the longer term, as our kind of infrastructure continues to build up, as testing gets better and there's faster, less invasive and sometimes less expensive testing, um, that, um, that that might become sort of more widespread. For the moment, it's probably not a practical suggestion kind of um, at, at scale. And what um, WHO was actually trying to say yesterday was, let's not focus so much on asymptomatic stuff, because we think if we really focus on, um, uh, on catching symptomatic people, doing contact tracing, quarantining those folks, if we do that really, really well, that may be enough to kind of keep the R below one and to start to break the back of this epidemic. And so their argument, which was muddled with some very poor messaging yesterday that led to all kinds of news reports saying, um, WHO says asymptomatic transmission is not important, it's not what they were saying. They were saying, focus your resources on the good shoe leather public health stuff, test, trace, isolate, um, uh, rather than diverting lots of resources to trying to catch a whole bunch of asymptomatic people. So it's clearly an area of kind of unsettled um, science and divergent views. But I'd say at this point, that widespread testing would be, would be impractical. There may be, sorry to go on with this, this answer, there may be some interesting ways to kind of get around this. I was doing a chat with um, uh, 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 some head teachers last week with the ASCL, great um, head teachers union. And we talked about something called batch testing, um, which was actually, I think, first done in Ghana, but also tested and validated in Germany. And the idea there is you take about, um, I've seen it up to 24 people, and you swab all those people and you put all the swabs in the same test kit. And so you can test 24 samples all at once. If it's negative, because it's a super sensitive test, right, the antigen test, you can say all of those people are negative. So you could test, for example, an entire classroom only using one test kit, theoretically. If it's positive, then you have to go back and test each individual. But that was, again, used in, in Ghana originally as a way to say, well, we'll listen with limited testing capacity. It's a really sensitive test. We could actually get a lot more people tested and kind of stretch our limited resources further. So it's a really cool necessity is the mother of invention kind of innovation. Um, and that, you know, that's something I think that should, is worth exploring further. Can I ask you a question about the antibody test? Uh, I now have a whole collection of people who have said, I never felt sick. I went and got these antibody tests. Wackily, it looks as though I've got the antibodies and I'm now kind of feeling like Superman or Superwoman and I'm going to just like, you know, run around in the subway. Um, so I have two questions to ask on that. Firstly, false positives or false negatives. Um, and two, how much confidence should people derive from, from those antibody tests? Yes, the two questions with an antibody test result are, is my test result accurate and what does it mean, right? So we'll start with, I guess, the first question around, is my test accurate? It really depends. We've seen loads and loads and loads of problems with, um, with antibody testing and, and false results, the scariest ones being false. You know, uh, well, I guess both um, in their different ways, right? False positive saying you do have antibodies when in fact you don't. That's probably the, the worst case scenario um, because you think you have some immunity when of course you still be vulnerable to infection. And the flip side, obviously a false negative, which for surveillance purposes would be a meaningful problem, but maybe not quite as risky. In some cases, we've seen as many 50% of, you 
you know, positive tests are wrong, particularly with some of the rapid antibody tests um, that have been coming out, the idea that you can just do sort of a finger stick and get a pretty rapid result versus the ones that use um, what's called ELISA technology, which is the kind of laboratory-based thing for which we do lots of different kinds of antibody testing for what's called IgM and IgG. Um, those have tended to fare a lot better and some of them have now been approved here in the UK, I think a Roche test in particular. So it depends a little bit on sort of what test you got and when and where. Um, and I'd be careful if for anybody going out with do, doing the private antibody testing um, that you know that you're getting um, a, a, a test that's actually been sort of validated here and, and approved here in the UK. Um, the second question is, if your test is positive, what does it mean? There's different kinds of tests that say different things. Some will actually give you a number, like a titer of antibodies, and that's a, like sort of the level of antibodies that you have in your system, a higher number, um, meaning presumably more immunity. Um, but there's probably a threshold, and so some of the tests just are kind of yes or no, and they're saying presence of antibodies, yes or no. Um, what we know so far suggests that if you have antibodies that are detectable, it probably gives you some level of protection from infection, some level of immunity. Um, we don't know if it's complete, but it's probably pretty good. We have no idea how long it lasts for. The only way to know for sure would be to continue to test yourself over time and see if those antibodies are still present. And it's gonna take more time before we figure out how durable the immune response is, both after infection and then hopefully someday after a successful vaccination. So early on, there was a lot of excitement about immunity passports or antibody passports and the combination of uncertainty about what the antibodies actually mean in practice and challenges with the testing have, uh, I think, thankfully led everyone to kind of put that on the back burner. I think there are lots of ethical issues with that. So um, it's, I guess if you have a positive antibody test, it should be reassuring, um, but, um, but it doesn't make you Superman or Superwoman. Um, final question, because we're almost out of time, but um, any treatment or vaccine updates that are, um, that are glimmers of hope, lights at the end of tunnels? Yeah, so real quick on vaccines, not tons of news. There's now over 120 vaccines under development and 10 in human trials. Um, the two kind of front runners are the, the Oxford vaccine, which we've talked about many times, and then um, one uh, a, a new kind of technology called mRNA vaccine um, run by Moderna with NIH in the US. Um, those are both kind of ramping up um, uh, for phase two and three trials are actually already enrolling for them. Both of them are already also producing vaccines, beginning to produce vaccines at scale, making a bet that if they're validated as safe and effective, they already would have a significant number of them. So AstraZeneca, which is uh, which has signed a licensing deal um, here in the UK for the Oxford vaccine, says. Um, I, I can't remember, the US one was 100 million. They're planning to make 100 million vaccines by the end of the year and hoping that if their trials stay safe and effective, they already have quite a few to roll out. So, you know, Anthony Fauci continues to say that he's optimistic for the possibility of a safe and effective vaccine with a significant amount available by the first quarter of 2021. I still find that really optimistic, but he knows so much more than I do. Um, so you can take that as a cautious little bit of optimism, but remembering that this is far from guaranteed, um, that's an everything goes perfectly, stars all align strategy. Um, on the treatment side, real quick, two things. Um, one, uh, there is um, has been some successful testing of a uh, of a drug that's an inhibitor of interleukin-6, um, which is part of the kind of immune response that, um, you know, most people when they get really sick in the ICU and die of this, die because of a, a, a totally overzealous immune response, something called cytokine storm. This is meant to cool down the body's response to COVID-19, appears to be um, useful. And so that's now being tested in combination with remdesivir, the antiviral. And the idea there is that hopefully Hopefully it can prevent people from getting super sick. So it's not going to stop someone from getting infected, but it might reduce the mortality, the this, this, this severe cases and the mortality rates, which would be extremely important, right? If we could, if we could reduce mortality significantly, 
that we could live with this disease much more than we can right now. Um, and then second is a, um, a cloned antibody, um, which has been developed, I believe, here in the UK um, that is, is now being tested and shown some promising very early results. We talked in the past about this, um, the use of convalescent plasma. So you'd sort of, you extract the serum from people who have recovered from COVID-19 and you'd sort of take their antibodies and inject them into other people. That's something, a technology that's a hundred years old um, that um, has also been sort of promising, but it's limited by how much convalescent plasma you can get from surviving donors, basically. Um, this is a little bit different in that there are specific antibodies that have then actually been made synthetically. The hope here actually is that if it's given to people early on infection, it might sort of prevent um, uh, prevent progression. And, and so that's something that is also being studied right now. Um, that may be difficult to produce at scale for some time, but it's another kind of tool in the arsenal that's showing some promise. I'm going to I'm going to resist the temptation because I know there's another there's another conduit uh, event backing up against this one and I will be punished if I keep going. So um, as always, thank you so much. It's just an absolutely a, a real tonic and a and a fantastic uh, summary of everything. And uh, I wish you and the family all the very best over the coming week. And see you next week. Thanks, Paul. Stay safe, everyone, and go to the next event. Obviously. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Ciao. Bye.